Hello, and welcome to Ben Yo Chats. If you're curious about the world, this show is for you. The world is more intangible today. How should this change our thinking? On this episode, I speak to Stian Westlake. We speak on what recession, war, inequality, competition, stagnation, and BS jobs mean in an intangible world. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast. Thank you. Be well. Hey, everyone. I'm super excited to be speaking with Stian Westlake. Stian is the chief exec at the Royal Statistical Society. And before that, he was a policy advisor to government and the executive director at Nesta, a UK innovation agency. He is the co-author, along with Jonathan Haskell, of Capitalism Without Capital. And they have a new book out, Restarting the Future. Uh, I think he's one of the most interesting thinkers on innovation and policy. And I'm not alone, as his works have been applauded from Bill Gates to Tyler Cowen. Welcome. Hi, Ben. Really good to be here. Great. So if the world is much more intangible today than ever before, when we enter the next recession, and some models are indicating significant probabilities of this happening by, say, 2023, do you think recession plays out differently in a really intangible world? I think this is a really good question. And in some senses, this, 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 this recession that we might be expecting will be the first really big recession in an, in an economy that's dominated by intangibles. And I guess there's a few things about the way intangibles work that, 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 that might change that. One thing that sort of is central to why an intangible economy is different is that intangible capital tends to be highly scalable. A bit of software, an algorithm, a brand can go a long way compared to tangible capital where you continually need to reinvest to scale it across a big business. And in some ways, that is good, at least for some companies. It means that there are companies that are maybe less dependent on the need to raise new capital, but will be more comfortable expanding, even if capital markets, as a result of the recession, become more, more, um, more, more, more difficult to access. And um, that, could, that, could, that could work very well. The flip side is that, you know, one of the things that we that, that, that is really important if we want to see intense competition in an intangible economy, I think one of the things we argue in the book is that competition works a little bit different in an intangible economy. So rather than the traditional model of competition, where what you want to see is lots of rivalrous companies in each industry, you can almost count them, it's quite easy to do. Um, because intangible companies tend to grow big and fast and exploit synergies, you often, good competition often looks a bit more like what a biologist would call punctuated equilibrium, you know, where the dinosaurs rule supreme for a million years and then an asteroid hits them and then something else kind of evolves to, to, to take up the slack. And I guess what that model depends on is it depends on attackers, on new companies being able to, 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 to take advantage of the scalability of intangibles and come up quickly from behind and embarrass the incumbents, you know, people will get bored of having Facebook accounts, kids will think Facebook Facebook accounts are for old people, and then suddenly there'll be a niche for someone else to come in. And I guess where that becomes important, or where a recession becomes potentially challenging there, is if this affects risk capital, if we've got something where, say, valuations of public companies feed back into the IPO market and therefore into um, into, into private market valuations, there's always the risk that um, the public markets, um, the public markets sneeze and the private markets catch a cold. And in a sense, we're we're more dependent potentially in an intangible economy on the availability of risk capital um, than we would be in a traditional it's a sort of competition than we would be in a traditional economy. And you make the point in the book that our ability to assess the value of intangible capital or the systems in place for say you can finance a loan on a piece of on a building property very easy very hard to finance a loan on an idea or something else and so this might be a very interesting uh follow-up for things well in a recession for for coming up with that with our idea of how much intangible capital we can actually uh really back up in terms of financializing that's a really good point i mean i it's it, 
it was it's interesting uh, maybe not in a good sense the word interesting but it's kind of it will be it'll be fascinating to see how this plays out because in a sense i guess we in a um in a in a recession in a tangible intensive economy businesses that fail will typically have a bunch of assets for which there are secondary markets so you know they 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 will have buildings that have plants and machinery which 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 can be sold now normally that's a great thing if you're a creditor, it gives you something you can take a charge on. Equally, I guess one of the problems of a really widespread recession is if everyone wants to, if every creditor wants to sell the assets of liquidated businesses, then something which, then the assets which you thought were very valuable, the kind of properties and the and the machines, suddenly become super abundant and everyone is trying to kind of buy or sale them. So I guess what is interesting to me is in a sense, in a in a in an intangible economy, your assets are almost like that already, if you see what I mean. So they're very hard to sell when a business fails anyway. So it's possible that that might that we that we might be in a better position because the difference that the recession makes to the salvage value of business assets is less. I mean, you sort of start off. Everyone kind of knows you're in a bad position already if you if you if you if you if if intangible businesses are your are your debtors. I so, see that. So they don't go necessarily distressed. I guess I would be worried that essentially, if you think about it in ideas, that a bunch of good ideas go down to zero, right? Partly because they needed to intersect and things. And those companies or those ideas just disappeared. So you can't even buy them uh, sort of distressed like you would buy a dis distressed asset or building uh, because they were in a bad place and then, they, and then they just disappear. But to your point, I can see the other side that actually maybe they don't lose as much value because they were already hard to value and in liquid. So actually there is something. And if particularly if you can get a larger company buyer, so not saying a, a new company, but we see this in biopharmaceuticals or tech, they can rescue that idea at a price which may have been similar to what they might have thought before, not as distressed because actually they know they're going for the idea, which was already very difficult to value. So we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. I had a question in from Tyler Cowan. And he asks, what are the national security problems involved with relying on so much intangible capital? Is that again very different from a tangible world? Well, it's a it's 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 been interesting to see some of these things playing out in um I mean the 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 recent kind of very sad situation that we're seeing developing in Ukraine. I mean, the um we've obviously uh, We've obviously seen the the way sanctions have played out against Russia. I mean, obviously, the West took much more extreme actions than I think many people had predicted before the, before the um, uh, before before the war started. But I think what's been amazing about that is because the modern economy depends so much on these highly scalable, intangible, intensive products. It's been quite remarkable how it seems how damaging that's been to Russia. So, um, you know, the fact that, um, I mean, some of these things are obviously very tech based and perhaps, you know, perhaps their salience is obvious. So the fact that, you know, the fashionable kids of Moscow can no longer use Instagram, that's, uh, that's, that's maybe one of the salient examples. But obviously the intangible economy is about much, much more than tech. And we see some really interesting manifestations of this around things like aviation. So insurers refusing to deal with, um, with, with aviation in, in, in Russia and that, appearing to ground planes to stop flights. The supply chains that drive maintenance not being a, a, a further causing damages to those kind of industries, and indeed the kind of dependence of things. There was a story the other day about the effect that this is having on dentistry in Russia, because dentistry is so dependent on very flexible supply chains with basically a bunch of, 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 of specialized manufacturers. So I guess that's an example. If you are a an interconnected relatively open an economy, and Russia was always the, the most relatively interconnected of the BRIC countries, um, the intangible economy kind of makes it easier to turn off those taps in a way. Um, I think the other thing that's been kind of interesting to see is how, um, how dependent some of these kind of more security-based, more military-based factors have been on intangible assets. We've probably all seen the stories of the dependence of um, the Russian Air Force on 
US GPS devices, which has led to them being more observable and perhaps has played a role in the fact that they have not been as present in the conflict as people thought they would be. Um, I think that kind of interconnectivity is, um, like many things in the intangible economy, is great for winners. It's great if you're the US or if you're a US ally and um, is probably not so great for, 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 for the losers. Yeah, I can see that. So supply chains, the, essentially, I guess, the financial war, the war in terms of intangible uh, capital flow. And then I guess there is, we only get a glimpse of it, but there's another kind of cyber war or tech war uh, happening as well as to, you know, whether you're interconnected. You probably see this in most in the financial part, like SWIFT and the messaging and things there, but an underlying stream. Uh, wow. In your book, with Jonathan Haskell, you note five observations of the world and you call these uh, symptoms, uh, stagnation, inequality, dysfunctional competition, which we touched upon, uh, fragility and authenticity or inauthenticity. And in the book, you describe that actually all of those symptoms are not as easily explained either by a traditional economic explanation or there seems to be some holes in what a traditional explanation uh, might be able to explain. And yet, if you were to use an intangible lens, uh, potentially you can explain more or at least differently on some of these things. So I thought it might be worth going through a few of those because they're so sort of relevant uh, today and, and how that might go and, and then the implications for policy and, and, and new institutions and things, which is kind of the other part of the book. So one of the first symptoms is stagnation. So people have called this the great stagnation. I guess some people have said um, stagnation is kind of inevitable. Uh, and some people have said this is this is a pause. Uh, those are traditional explanations. Uh, what's your reading of the stagnation problem? And how are you thinking about it? Yeah, so this is um, stagnation is kind of one of the, the the big and maybe obvious symptoms of what we've called the, the great economic disappointment that's been affecting the world for most of the tour, but certainly the developed world for most of the 21st century. And um, I think if we look at um, if we look at the stagnation question, it's pretty clear that economic growth um, since at least 2005, before, before the global financial crisis in the US, in countries in Europe and elsewhere has been significantly lower than than trend. So I think that is that's 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 somewhat uncontroversial. Um, I think the 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 interesting thing for us is a decent chunk of that that falling away in growth is what economists will call to total factor productivity. So it's productivity, it's it's the ability to every year do things better and better. And one of the things that causes that is the spillovers caused by intangibles. You know, a new idea comes out, it gets widely adopted. Where you see that, or where an economist would see that, is in is in, in is in rising TFP. So 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 that kind of fallen away. And the interesting thing um, is that the whole book is or our work is predicated on the fact that. As, as, as you know, intangible investment has been growing very steadily for, 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 for decades in, in, in pretty much all developed and developing countries. But one of the things that we noticed looking at the data is that since about the time of the financial crisis just before, in quite a lot of countries, that growth rate began to level out. Um, and this is really interesting. It's something it took us a while to realize it. And it was something we hadn't really spotted when we were writing the 2017 book, because you really had to clean the data and so forth. But in places like the UK, um, it seemed that although there's this kind of underlying dynamic in the economy driving us towards an intangible economy, our ability to invest in that for some reason was, was beginning to slow down. And that translates directly into this kind of falling total factor total factor productivity and what we attribute this to and the kind of the the, the the second half of the book looks at this is the fact that we don't really have the right institutions to encourage to provide and to manage the new challenges of an intangible economy that's really interesting and thinking about the new institutions just on the stagnation point some people argue, well, it's all great, we need these new organizations and ideas, but isn't a lot of the world still uh, tangible? So what about all of these new electric charges that we might need, or what are these new heat pumps we might uh, need? And maybe we can go back in history, because I think it's quite interesting. So 
when we figured out public health, we wanted clean water. So, you know, we got the sewers and everything about, but I, I believe there were these like waterworks boards and these organizations which came around in this kind of coordination problem. And to what extent do you think that that coordination problem is now even harder and we now need these institutions? So it's not, I was speaking to someone recently saying, we have the heat pump technology, we just don't know how to coordinate it all and, and get it all done. So actually it's, it becomes an intangible problem more than an intangible problem. What do you think? Well, I think that's really right. And you mentioned earlier that one of the issues, one of these five big problems that we talk about is this idea of fragility, the fact that the economy is vulnerable to whether it's climate change or COVID. And I think there's something really counterintuitive about how that relates to the intangible economy, because quite a lot of people, when we talk to them about intangibles, they say, well, surely these big existential challenges aren't about this kind of fluffy intangible stuff. They're about really hard physical assets. And, um, you know, the climate change is a great example where I've heard people say that surely climate change is about building renewable energy sources, as you say, building heat pumps and, and, and that kind of thing. But I think what's so interesting is when you look into what is really hard about transitioning to a low carbon economy, um, it turns out that it's not the tangible stuff that's hard. It's the intangible stuff. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, we take, for example, UK electricity generation is a really is, is, is an interesting example. The UK, you know, not perfect, but it's done an amazing job of transitioning its electricity generation away from coal fired power stations, things that generate a lot of carbon. It's gone a very long way towards a much lower carbon economy and it's continuing to push on. It turns out that, you know, so long as you're so long as you're allowed to, it's quite easy to build wind turbines. It's easy to move from coal to natural gas, which is somewhat, somewhat, somewhat less carbon intensive and so forth. But it turns out that the hard stuff in terms of um, the hard stuff in terms of electricity generation is all the intangible stuff about permitting being allowed to build a nuclear power station, getting local permissions to put up wind turbines and those kind of things. It's the soft stuff, not the hard stuff. And then similarly, when we get to the things in the economy that are really hard to decarbonize, again, the problem with, an air, with installing air source heat pumps to replace gas boilers to make domestic heating carbon free is not the problem of affording the air source heat pump. The problem is that when you install it, it requires you to reconfigure systems. It requires you to persuade people to adopt these. It requires a lot of complex changes to the way people use heat and those kind of things. And again, it becomes a it's a problem of systems and a social problem. Um, actually, the, the 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 tangible capital stuff is in all these things the really easy part, even though that's not obvious. And I would go perhaps even further. And I think Mark. Andreessen made this argument, uh, he's a big uh, VC person, about software eating the world. But then he updated part of this argument to suggest that where the intangible, so software, can meet the hardware of the world, it can improve it. And so this is the, the innovation or the big uh, question mark for where intangibles can do is, so for instance, we have all of these heat pumps, but can we coordinate them so that we can uh, and with batteries and everything, so that we can say sell electricity back to the grid. So you've got all of the tangible parts, but is there something intangible? And he would put it uh, uh, for software. So all of these, all of these things. How true do you think that might be? That actually there is this part where intangible meets tangible, and you get these really big benefits if you can solve the problem, or is it more a kind of organizational systems um, that it's just there within institutional capital? So I think this is absolutely crucial. And, you know, if we're thinking about this from a business point of view, this is the way to create very large amounts of value in the next in the next 10 years. Um, you know, what one of the an interesting kind of uh, an interesting business development, you know, over the last five years, that I think sort of sums this up is um, what's been happening in the used car market, both in the US and in the UK. You know, in the US, I guess Carvana is the big player in the UK. Um, zoo and others but i guess what we're seeing there is in some senses the used car business is the antithesis of an intangible of, of an intangible economy first of all you're dealing with buying and selling um you're, you're dealing with buying and selling uh 
physical assets and you know you have to store them in showrooms and those kind of things typically these businesses have not had great investment in 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 software and so forth and you know even things like brands have not been particularly powerful this is quite a fragmented industry and you can your stereotype of a used car salesperson is very different from the stereotype of your kind of knowledge economy worker or your intangible economy worker so you've got an economy that's you've got an industry that feels a very long way from 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 the intangible economy but what's really interesting to see what has happened with um with these businesses is they have partly through the expenditure of a lot of risk capital and a lot of experimental a lot of experiment by by entrepreneurs, so you know Alex Chesterman behind Kazoo in the UK, um, have broken through and created a system where a bunch of intangible assets, ranging from a kind of national or international brand, an incredibly sophisticated software layer, and a bunch of processes around giving people the confidence to overcome the kind of classic informational problems of buying used cars. What happens if you buy a lemon? What happens if you sell the car and you know you you you, you don't get a fair price? Um, and um, that that you know that is a, a a really sort of material little industry that has that has that has been transformed, um, you know, significantly through the expenditure of a lot of risk capital. That makes a lot of sense. And then, if you have that, and you have all of these winners, and you'll have winners in business and things, is it inevitable that we're going to see more inequality? because growth seems to come along with some of this inequality. Is there a, a differing or a more challenging explanation once you view it through an intangible lens? So I think there definitely is. And one of the really interesting things that, that, that economic research sort of pushed the frontier on in the last kind of 15 years is um, you saw a lot more economists doing sophisticated things with linking firm data and individual income data. A lot of it was done in Scandinavia because they have such amazing employee data sets, but there's been some really good work done on the US census as well. And one of the things that this showed is a really big part of the rise in income inequality in both the US and Scandinavia, and we suspect other countries, arises from the difference between the kind of what, what economists would call the leader and the laggard firms, the industry dominating firms and the also rands. Um, so this is not the kind of the, the gap between chief executives and janitors. It's the gap between the chief executive of kind of a very big and successful firm and the chief executive of a sort of failing micro business um, or equivalently staff at those organizations. And um, I guess why that's interesting is one of the very strong forces of intangibles, as you implied, is that it creates a wedge between the leading firms in an industry and the laggard firms. One another really interesting finding is um, for a long time, economists, particularly at places like the OECD, have been pointing out that the gaps between leader firms and laggard firms in industries have been growing um, and that this is a driver of inequality. There's been a lot of debate about why that might be the case, but we looked at how that varied by, um, by the intangible intensity of industries. And one of the interesting things is basically where the industries that have the wide leader laggard gaps are the ones where there are a lot of intangibles. So again, that seems to, so there's a kind of, there's a, a smoking gun for why this is driving inequality in a significant way right there. And I guess this is a similar explanation for how we might think about competition differently because of how intangibles affect competition. So we mentioned this briefly, but do you want to highlight how actually if you throw it through an intangible lens, you might end up with quite different competition policy or ideas versus what you were 50 years ago when you, more, when you just wanted a lot of competition because everything was tangibles and widgets? Yeah, that's right. And I mean, obviously, this is a huge um, economic policy issue on both sides of the Atlantic at the moment. You've got the FTC in the US, you've got um, the uh, competition directorate in the EU at the moment, pushing a kind of quite aggressive line on um, competition policy, especially with regard to digital platforms. And to some extent, that is informed by a philosophical view, what sometimes gets called the neo-Brandesian view, um, which sort of holds that competition authorities have failed in the last few decades because they've kind of taken the foot off the gas. They have been more open to lobbying. They've been more open to kind of um, what they would describe as right-wing ideologies, and therefore they've been more willing to tolerate anti-competitive practices. And I think what the an intangible perspective brings to that debate is it says, well, you know, that may well be part of the equation, 
But there's also something going on, which is that the nature of businesses that depend on intangible capital is that they will be more prone to what classically would look like monopoly, you know, for large businesses with valuable intangibles to do really, really well. And if you sort of say, well, what then does good competition look like in, in, in that economy? You know, it might not look like splitting up Facebook so that you have, so that you're, when you look at the box on how many social media companies are there, there are five rather than four or whatever. Um, what it might look like instead is making sure that you have a situation where the new competitor to Facebook um, has access to capital, has access to to, 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 to to the ability to expand so that one day Facebook can be can be dethroned. Now, that is really challenging for policymakers because it's really easy to look at a Herfindahl index, which tells you, you know, how many companies are there in, in an industry and how big are they? You know, that is a sort of a discrete mathematical algorithmic task. But to sort of say, how confident are we that one day when, you know, imponderably Facebook stumbles, that they will be dethroned? That's a much harder question. It's much more open to judgment. And it relies on kind of quite a lot more expertise on the part of of of, of regulators, and I think that's something that's 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 a that's a big political demand that we would see on institutions in the future. And I see that. So I speak to a lot of startups or entrepreneurs or even smaller uh, market cap uh, companies, and part of their thinking is that well, if we go fairly well, but not absolutely amazingly well so they might create 10 times value and not a thousand times value then facebook or someone like actually might buy us because there's some value there and actually we might only pursue that because that is a industry buyer as well as say a public markets route and they will argue that actually if uh, if that is dethroned to to some extent they lose some of their incentive to try and start and develop that i'm not exactly sure how True it is, but it is definitely something they say. And if they're going to do a 10,000 or 100,000 times returns, they're in it. They, they would not necessarily sell, but they know they have a some backstop if they can create some value or not. And they are worried about uh, stymieing that. And there's another interesting thing you, you put because partly the answer, if we could stomach it, is to have more, how would we put it, technocratic expertise. And we see this, or you make the point in the book, and I'm seeing this across so many domains. So planning would be another one. If you could just get someone to look at this project and go, well, you know what? I can, I can look at all of these trade-offs in the round and say, this is probably a project which should go ahead. And you have some sort of technocratic expertise in, in doing that, then that would be great. Um, I spend quite a lot of time in patents and IP, and patents have kind of got this broadly standardized um, 20 years. Uh, but I can see that there's obviously some ideas which are much more valuable and some which really probably should never pass through a patent office. And if you had technocratic expertise, you could maybe somehow even put those in buckets or decide and get actually much more value from your intangible ideas because you've not just given them the same 20 years or whatever it is on, uh, on copyright. So to what extent do you think your book then argues for technocratic expertise putting to side the uh, political economy question to one side because there seems to be maybe this ongoing pushback against uh, technocrats I'm, I'm not exactly sure but is that essentially what uh, calling for it because that would answer something around um, the stagnation and in institutional capital it might answer something around competition it might even answer something around the authenticity uh, questions as well so I think that's absolutely spot on. I mean, we what we see in an economy where in an economy where the nature of capital hasn't changed very much and where you don't have these really detailed questions like observing competition policy or you know working out how you should assess a kind of where assessing a kind of complex pattern becomes more important. In those kind of um, economies, uh, your rules can be pretty algorithmic, whether that's about competition policy or whether that's, you know, that every patent kind of gets assessed by a potentially not super skilled um, uh, uh, patent attorney and so forth, or patent, uh, patent inspector. Um, in an economy where intellectual property is that much more 
economically important, where you have to make more finely balanced judgments about competition, where potentially there are really important quality and quantity trade-offs about research funding. So, you know, one of the big pitches around organizations like ARPA and uh, those kind of big um, research funding agencies is they really depend on having very, very good program managers. Um, all of those things point to a situation where you need higher skilled bureaucrats, frankly, um, with greater discretion. Um, so that is a kind of, you know, you could, if you were being unkind, you could call that a bureaucrat's charter. And I think there is a sort of, um, there is, there is a, there is a political economy question that we might want to come on to next about what the implications that of of that are. But it broadly suggests that you need, you need institutions that have what might be called higher state capacity that have stronger ability to make judgments and a stronger ability to act on them. So let's take an example. I'll borrow it from the US. So take it away from the UK for a moment. They, during the pandemic, I think this was in San Francisco or, or California somewhere, uh, they brought in the ability for restaurants to have these structures called parklets. So these little huts on the road where people could eat outdoors. And they were judged a success. Everyone, restaurants liked them, people liked them. Uh, it was judged a good thing. So they thought, well, let's try and make this permanent. And then when they went through the legislation for this, and Ezra Klein has covered this quite well uh, for the New York Times, they found that once everyone had a say in how parklet should be done, so once fire and road and transport and safety, um, very few people then wanted to do parklets anymore because they'd be very expensive or half the parklets which were already available had to be taken down because they wouldn't meet uh, regulations. And in some sense, you wanted someone to have a common, common sense view and said, well, you know what, parklets across this road are kind of all right. And we understand if there was a fire, it might make it a little bit harder, but broadly this would seem to make common sense. But the system is not geared up for anyone to be able to, to do that. And so what seems to be that idea that everyone can kind of agree on, parklets seem to be a nice thing, uh, can't actually get uh, executed, can't actually be done in, uh, in a kind of these sophisticated um, regulated environments. Is there a way of unpicking that? Is that a form of kind of institutional capital? Or is that kind of inevitably, as we get more intangible and more special interest in, in where we then, that it becomes log jams like that? Well, I think what you're seeing in that example is um, a situation where the circumstance, the situation in which the regulatory, the regulatory framework was meant to govern, changed really rapidly. And that's something where, you know, high state capacity organization can respond to and one that is being run on kind of more economical lines in a more kind of simple kind of rules based way finds it harder to respond to. So that's, you know, classic example of, um, you know, where red tape, where, where, where red tape is allowed to run riot and get in the way. Um, I think the, I guess the, the interesting trade off then here comes if we sort of say, well, what what do you lose? So you obviously, if you increase discretion and sort of state capacity, you 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 gain flexibility and the ability to respond to these kind of things. But what do you lose? And there's a kind of um, classic political economy um, finding here where what you actually lose is a certain sort of power to resist corruption and resist political influence. So to take a classic example of central bank independence, um, once upon a time in countries um, countries like the UK, you had massive political infer interference in interest rates and governments would put the interest rate down before an election so there'd be a little boom and everyone would feel happy, but you know, it's sort of disastrous for long-term economic credibility. Now, what, um, what governments did was they said, okay, let's make central banks independent. Let's give them a very narrow um, remit, inflation targeting, and then they will they will, they will no longer be will, like, you know, Odysseus tying himself to the mast. We will no longer have this temptation to mess around with things in a way that we all know to be unhelpful. Now, that's great if the circumstance never changes. If all you ever need to do is do sort of fairly straightforward inflation targeting in a narrow bound, you're kind of fine. But one of the things that became challenging if we look at, say, central banking is obviously in recent years until not long ago, we were in this kind of we were very close to the zero bound, and indeed governments were central banks were doing huge amounts of quantitative easing, which often started to take quite novel, um, quite novel forms. So, for example, you know, you'd had situations where 
the Bank of England was kind of getting involved in corporate bonds and having to make potentially quite, you know, what, what could have been in some people's hands quite nuanced decisions. Um, now, the interesting thing there is that we didn't, um, is that, um, you know, we were using a system that was designed for a very particular set of terms for a scenario where, um, where, the, where, where the situation had changed and we needed, we needed much, much more dynamism. But I think what you, the, the simple systems are really good when you really understand what's happening and you don't expect it to change. But this move to an intangible economy is a classic example of things changing and needing more discretion and maybe being willing to pay for that by being willing to accept a bit more of that, of, of, of that discretion and the risk of political influence. Okay, that, that makes sense on the political economy trade-off. And I, I mentioned that because it's a small example of the fact that cities have become more complicated and it appears to me that they need more of this technocratic expertise. And I think this is one of the arguments you really make uh, in the book on, on, on the cities and the fact that you think of cities as very tangible, coming back to that, but actually a lot of the challenges that they have are really where the intangible is meeting them. Planning, design, organizational uh, capacity for net zero, um, all, of these, uh, all of these type of things. And I wonder on the political economy question here, so we can maybe talk about it in, in respect of, of the cities, there is, I'm sensing in recent times, this kind of more, I guess you could call it populist, but this kind of slight suspicion of the technocrat, uh, maybe because of political corruption, or maybe because some of these technocratic things just seem, um, seem so, so far removed. Is this a solution for cities? And do you think that it is uh, politically uh, tenable? So I guess the key thing about cities is cities, you know, cities are very much made of tangible objects, they're made of buildings, um, but they are the place where the intangible economy, to a great extent, um, disproportionately happens because they're where the spillovers between ideas, they're where the synergies, um, they're where the synergies occur. And um, as you say, the thing that stops us growing cities typically are planning restrictions and those kind of rules, which, you know, you could see as a type of intangible asset, the claims that people have over, the, over these things. But I think specifically, if we think about these, about what's going on, our planning system is kind of an institution or a set of interlocking institutions that, that, that allow people, that, that, that help people make certain trade-offs between, you know, I own some land, I want to build a building, but I might inconvenience my neighbor. And that's sort of the, 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 the collective action problem that the planning system is meant to um, is meant to solve. Now, the planning system, frankly, was designed at a time when people were pretty suspicious of cities, both for political reasons and for for, for economic reasons. There's a kind of wonderful letter written by Thomas Jefferson where he basically says cities are just these terrible places. They're full of disease. They're full of rent seekers. They're full of these kind of nasty people who don't produce anything. So we really want to make sure that our new nation has very small cities and we don't encourage people to flock to them. And, you know, that kind of mindset, although, you know, that was a couple of hundred years ago, has not, you know, has not, has, has always been with us in some sense. The kind of garden city mentality that, you know, was very predominant in the UK in the early 20th century was also was 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 also that mindset and you know that was what our planning laws were based on so anyway there was you know there was a world in which we thought well cities aren't really that important and they're pretty dirty and they're pretty germy so let's create a system that highly privileges people's right to not being overlooked and to preventing their neighbors developing things because the cost is quite low you know what does it matter if london doesn't get bigger i mean london was emptying out until sort of the 1990s in any case um and we're now in a situation where, because these intangibles are so important, we really want cities to be able to get bigger, not just for the benefits of the people who live there, but for the benefits of the people who would be able to earn a lot more and be more prosperous if they could move to cities if they could only afford to pay the rent. Um, and I guess when we talk about what sort of institutions you need, you need institutions that allow people to do deals. So if we think about, say, somewhere like San Francisco or Manhattan, where property prices are extremely expensive because these are highly productive places, lots of intangible activity going on there. We know that, you know, if you could ignore the law and build whatever you wanted to on your plot of land, it would create an enormous amount of value. You would become very rich if you could sort of knock down your kind of three-story Victorian row house in San Francisco and build a kind of vast block of flats or something. Um, now, one 
way of fixing this problem is to allow certain areas to say, okay, well, we will let you develop, but if you develop, um, you share the gains with the people who are inconvenienced. So one of, one of the ways this, this has been described as street votes, you allow zoning decisions rather than to be made at a level of cities or you know, in the UK local authorities, where there are so many people, it's almost impossible to do any kind of deal to share the gains. You do these things at a level of a street and you say that everyone will participate in the kind of very large amounts of wealth that will be created. Now, not every street is gonna to want to redevelop, but you don't need every street to redevelop to allow cities to densify very significantly. Um, but what you do need to do is to create that kind of institutional escape valve so that the people who want to do those deals to share the kind of upside can do them, which without that, there's kind of no way of no way of doing the decisions are taken at a different place. Yeah, new ways of thinking on that. So maybe thinking about those last two observations, which were around fragility and inauthenticity, how does an intangible explanation think about those two observations? So authenticity is a really interesting one. When I talk to economists about this, they, they always raise an eyebrow because what we the, the problem of authenticity as we describe it is that this worry that the economy doesn't seem to be as real as it should be, that jobs don't seem to be kind of real. You know, we all spend, people, so many people spend their time shuffling bits of paper or sending messages to one another and so forth. And I think, you know, if you've been through the professional training of an economist, you've had concerns like this kind of totally hammered out of you. <laughs> um, so economists often look at this and say, well, you know, why should I care about that? What's interesting is when I talk to people who are not economists about this, whether they are, you know, people who work in other sort of knowledge-based disciplines or, or, you know, people who, you know, just ordinary people, this is something that people are very familiar with. And obviously it's a huge um, element of populist politics, the feeling that, you know, there was once an economy based on really making stuff and that, you know, that we've somehow morally lost something that we no longer do this. Or, you know, if we take someone like David Graeber, the late anthropologist who um, wrote this kind of influential article and book called Bullshit Jobs, which was about the idea that, you know, everyone spends their time doing stuff that doesn't really matter. Um, this is clearly something that when we think about things that people are disappointed in about the economy, it's something that really touches a nerve among, at least among non-economists. And I guess the story there is that, you know, this is kind of what you would expect to see in an economy dominated by intangibles because you know we talked about how intangibles have a lot of synergies they're very valuable when you combine them they have a lot of spillovers the, the knowledge about the economic benefits of intangibles often kind of escape the business that invests in them and it's sort of unsurprising that that leads to a lot of jobs that involve kind of corralling those spillovers making those synergies um I had a fascinating conversation um some time ago with um what I guess you could call a kind of intellectual property family office. So this was the the um, the people who ran the creative estate of a you know very famous children's author who passed away a while ago, and you know the company was owned by his heirs, and their job was within certain limits to maximise the value of this kind of pantheon of um, children's children's books that the, 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 the original author had written. And they were basically brokers of intangible assets. They spent a lot of time thinking about how to maximize the legal claims on those assets. So, you know, the, the right approach to copyright law. And as you probably know, you can extend copyright law by making derivative works, by changing, by, by changing things in the right way. So there are, there, are, there are aesthetic decisions that one can make about an estate like that that make them more valuable. Equally, they spent a lot of time brokering deals with other production companies. And I guess things like, you know, the Marvel Extended Universe, a classic example of how in the modern economy, a relatively, what was once thought of as probably a kind of trivial intellectual property asset can be worth, can turn into a franchise worth absolutely billions across the whole range of media and, 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 and toys. And they were also responsible for sort of thinking about the reputational side of these, of, 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 um, of this brand, as it were, and thinking about, well, where do we want to be positioned? How do we want this uh, to be seen as, as, as positive? Now, I suspect if you were to go to a sort of, um, you know, if you were to ask 
Marine Le Pen or Donald Trump, what they thought about people who spent their time doing these things, they will say this is a terrible sign of modern Western decadence. And, you know, actually, things would be much better if more people did honest jobs in factories or fields. Um, but you expect to have more jobs like this in an intangible economy. And indeed, they, they, they in a, in a, in a second order way, create a lot of things that people appreciate and make people's lives better. I can definitely see that you have these more jobs which are involved with uh, the intangible world. But when I was reading that section, I did think it was quite intersectional, maybe with the idea of trust or perhaps culture. So you have these people who say have jobs in crypto, and I could definitely say some people say, oh, well, those, those are BS jobs. Or maybe you even have some of these second order derivative jobs where you have yoga, personal trainers, and, and sort of jobs uh, like that. And my reading of that is when people trust that either other people or trust that these jobs are really doing adding value, and particularly in an intangible world, you're not sure, but there's now so many types of intangible things, you're kind of vaguely not sure about them. If you trust that that is something that is adding value, then actually you don't mind, you don't think it, you don't think it's necessarily BS, like yoga teachers probably uh, not so bad as a crypto job for some people who don't understand crypto or don't trust that it's really um, adding value. And I wonder if there was a kind of more cultural acceptance of either innovation or weirdness or these things around the intangible world that would solve the problem uh, around that. So it's not necessarily to do with um, a falseness, which I guess authenticity or, or sort of the BS idea is, but it's actually really to do with trust. And actually that goes back to some of our own institutions and things like that. If you trust institutions or you trust the laws or you, you trust these type of things, then social cohesion is, is a kind of collective action problem. You Going back to the Quakers, you trust their handshake. So contracts and things got done. You didn't have to, to write it down. And, and I wondered whether that was a little bit upstream from that, albeit as intersectional, because these jobs have been created from the intangible world. That's a really interesting question. I mean, so one way of looking at it is that let's, if we describe, if we describe these potentially suspect jobs as basically being service jobs of various sorts, so, you know, there's, there's a sort of high status attached to at least some primary sector jobs and manufacturing jobs. But, you know, all these jobs that you talk about, whether it's crypto trading or um, rights management or yoga teaching are kind of broadly speaking service sector jobs and the service sector jobs without a strong moral component. There's not being a doctor or a nurse or a firefighter or those kind of things. So I guess there's an interesting thing. If we look back in history, once upon a time, probably a disproportionate number of service sector jobs were basically rent seeking. They were basically about apportioning existing value rather than creating value. And I'm here thinking, I'm thinking back to Thomas Jefferson's day here, thinking back a, way, a long time ago, you know, back in the economy, there was back in the back in the old days of the economy, there were probably farmers, there were some blacksmiths, and there were courtiers. And actually, all the courtiers did was they praised the king until the king gave them a sinecure or something like that. I'm slightly stylizing here. But in an economy like that, you'd be extremely suspicious of service sector job because a disproportionate number of them would be um, would be uh, would be rent seekers would 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 not be creating value and any money that they made any riches they accumulated would be basically taken from someone else there's kind of no value created there and I guess in an intangible economy more and more of those jobs are actually genuinely value creating I mean obviously in the economy now 70 to 80 percent of the economic activity is, is is service sector activity so you'd expect a lot of service sector activity to 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 to, to be to be value creating otherwise something is sort of fairly significantly going wrong um but you probably have a world where that that has changed over time and as the economy gets more intangible you will be seeing more people you know an even greater percent of service se service sector jobs are 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 are, are value creating and I think, and I wonder there's this generational, because when I speak to 20-somethings, I think a lot of them do not think these are BS jobs. In fact, a lot of them are going into crypto or subs, or in fact, you know, they go, well, I won't do this, but I'm going to become a personal trainer. So th there is that. And they, they think they're genuinely adding value as opposed to, uh, as opposed to rent seeking. In your book, you kind of avoid a lot of uh, political economy questions. I think that might be wise. Uh, but about what's sort of tractable or not in policy, I think is kind of very interesting. Maybe you could call it the so-called 
Overton window of, of possibilities. Uh, but one of your suggestions, which commented in the book, I thought was probably not that tractable. Uh, therefore, I was quite interested about why you proposed it. And this was the idea of equal tax treatment of debt and equity, which actually from an economist's point of view, and you can make the argument about why that would seem, but actually there seem to be so many special interests around why that is in globally, uh, that it would seem quite far away from being uh, enacted. So why do you think this idea is quite important to discuss and what would be the benefits of equal tax treatment of uh, debt and equity finance? So I think the 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 reason we've the reason we've the reason we've included it and mentioned it, I think, is just that there's an awful lot to play for here. So one of the big implications of an intangible economy is intangible based businesses are generally more suitable to equity finance than debt finance. And, you know, with the exception of some sort of small but important bits of the economy, like, you know, high growth tech firms, for the most part, most business finance is still debt. Most business finance is still is still undertaken by banks. Um, because intangible capital tends to be sunk, which means it's no good as collateral, um, and just because of institutional path dependence, it takes a long time to set up new modes of financing and to make them work, as you know better than me, um, we're still stuck with a predominantly debt-based economy. I think the reason why this kind of potential equalization of the tax treatment of equity and debt is worth pushing for is because it's such a powerful lever, it's such a kind of thumb on the scales. And to the extent that intangible assets become more and more important to the economy each year, the cost of the, the tax shields of debt, the favored tax treatment of debt, basically grows every year. Now, I you're you're hundred percent right that to 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 score a victory on this would be would only come after the most incredible political fight. There are a lot of people who would be very, very greatly inconvenienced and you know business models destroyed and businesses laid low by this change. Um, but I think if someone were to say to me, what you know, if someone would say to me, I buy all the stuff about the intangible economy, what is the biggest if that we could make the biggest sort of political battle to fight, it will be it will be that one. The nice thing about this is a lot of the design work has been done. So Nobel laureate James Mealy's kind of set a pretty detailed plan for how you would set put in place a system of equity tax credits. Um, the UK government spent quite a while working on this in the mid 2000s, got derailed by the small matter of the global financial crisis, and then the idea got dropped. The Belgian government of all places has done some work on 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 developing this. So it's one of these things where if someone said, "Tell me something that doesn't require a lot of new research, that doesn't that's sort of that's somewhat oven ready, but just requires political will," I'd be well. This is this is the big kahuna. Great. And any other policy idea which is probably outside the Overton window that you'd want to highlight or push within this? This is the. Big so I one. guess the other. The other, the other, the other big thing is um, greater public investment in mm. intangibles. Now, you know, in some ways, this is this is this is this is not super controversial because most countries are saying, well, you know, we want to invest more in publicly funded R and D and so forth. Um, I think the growing importance of the intangible economy really um, ups the ante on this. It means that investing in these kind of intangibles is 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 all the more important. I guess the wrinkle that that, that our book would throw on this is that you also need to invest pretty actively in how you make sure your system encourages high quality investment in intangibles, as 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 well as maxing out the quality uh, of the quantity. And um, I think that's where some of these experiments that we're seeing in new ways of funding science, whether that's stripping out the bureaucracy so scientists aren't wasting a lot of time on applying for research grants, or whether that's coming up with more entrepreneurial funding channels, which is kind of the other extreme. So some of these what are get called private ARPAs, sort of private versions of the US Advanced Research Projects Agency that funded a lot of breakthrough tech, computer technology research. But there are a few of these private ARPAs being set up by Silicon Valley billionaires that I think are really interesting um, approaches to, 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 to how you might do that. I completely agree. And I see no reason, or at least no theoretical reason, 
why we can't both increase quantity and quality. It's like you can definitely walk and chew gum and this. And I definitely think at least UK government, and I think probably all governments are kind of slightly missing a trick. Maybe they haven't realized how much technology has moved on. So arguably 20 years ago, you could make the case that government led some sort of technology was going to be a disaster. They didn't really know about innovation and that. But technology has moved on so far that actually some things which seem to maybe say 60 some things is almost technological magic is really a baseline level of technology that even small, medium, large organizations are using, which hasn't necessarily hit public sector because of an older cultural way of thinking. I, I think even in the UK, what's the government uh, department, the GDS, the design part, you know, public uh, yeah, yeah, sector yeah. as a service, they've done really great work, but it hasn't managed to infiltrate as widely uh, as it could do. So they do quality for all these various types of things. And that seems to be just one element. So I would, I would definitely agree with that. So yeah, if that you could sense. choose one new type of institution, so I guess this is policy or institution uh, that we could create, what would it be? I think this is something where I mean I would I would I would go for the the kind of the 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 experimental experimental research funding agency seems to be kind of one good institution. I think the other the other the other thing that would top my list would be and this is kind of institution not in the sense of organization but institution in the sense of set of rules would be this idea of how do you do of of doing hyper local planning to make it easier to build I think that would also make uh, that would make a huge difference and I think one of the interesting crossovers between those kind of things is that if you did make it easier to build residential housing offices in streets in cities again you don't think of that as being very technological, but that might actually have big technological benefits as well. Because when I think of, um, you know, university towns, these are often highly space constrained places, you know, whether we're looking at, say, Palo Alto in California or Cambridge in England, very, very high house prices, which mean that the brilliant ideas that get funded often by government in these places, um, it's very hard to start businesses based on them because you're, you know, it's hard to, hard to attract a workforce if it's so expensive to live there. Um, and so I think there's a really interesting thing that, you know, planning liberalization, if done the right way, is not just a, a, a is not just a sort of housing policy intervention, it's also a tech policy intervention as well. Interesting. Yeah, I can see that. I, and there's a lot of work going on about actually how that the housing challenge, the kind of Gordian knot is if you can unleash that would would have so many positive effects. I would probably work on a new branch of uh, the patent office. I really think more differentiation on that could be really uh, could be really uh, helpful. I see that a lot of my healthcare work when I, I can look at drugs and things in the world. You know, one of the reasons you could argue that we haven't got a lot of new antibiotics is that we're actually not paying enough for antibiotics at the moment. And there's a lot of other these mechanisms, you know, bulk buy, advanced purchase to get around that. But actually, the, the way you really need it is much more granularity about the kind of patent monopolies that you gave. And if you could do that, and across the other things, you know, some software is more valuable or not, even with some gradation, I think you'd add value. But as a new institution, I, I think I would plump for uh, something around public health. And I know we have public health institutions. And I would put one arm well, the whole thing would really be around uh, preparedness. That's why I would say it's new. So obviously pandemic preparedness is a thing, but I, I can already see that investment on that is really dying from government. So there's some private um, um, or uh, nonprofit things, but governments are basically, you have a boom and bust within pandemic funding, uh, which I've now seen yet again. Uh, saw this with, um, you know, when we had bird flu and other this, and I thought, oh, this will be the one time, this is big enough that I have, but it, I'm, I'm seeing it already uh, pick it up. But also, I actually think uh, essentially uh, digital machine learning public health, uh, if we were to have a buy in about how essentially our uh, public health stats could be used, and we got the intangible capital that and organization that, we would have an extraordinary leap in our ability uh, to be healthier as a populace. Uh, and again, this would be more prevention. So this is preparedness mm. rather than treatment. But politically, what you'd need to uh, 
allow or you need buy-in is that the public would have to be prepared to give up its data, which it already does to Facebook and Google, but to somehow give it to this new institution. And they say, with this data, we will make you more healthy. And I completely believe it's possible now. It's, it's, it's the cutting edge of where we are, but it's, it, it's there, but we actually don't have the new institution and then the political economy to make it true. And I find it's unbelievable that we give up all of this uh, data to Facebook, yet we are uh, a little bit cautious about what we have with our NHS and other data. And so that's actually a cultural political economy question. But if, if we were to do that, I think we would have a huge potential boost. But anyway, that would be my one. Yeah. Uh, so one question on this, what one belief that you have, perhaps economic or policy belief that you have now has changed over the last decade or has been updated? Has, has there been anything that you might have held fairly true or even very true and you kind of think, you know what, I think either the world has changed or the data that, or I just think actually I was fooled and I just don't think that's true anymore. So I think one thing that I've that 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 I've got more confidence in is the and this is a very kind of big and wide ranging thing, but is the ability um, of our institutions to renew themselves or be renewed. So this is something I think a lot of people have been very pessimistic about, you know. And um, I think in this sort of this is this is something where you know in the early two thousands it felt like there was not a lot of hope. Our institutions felt quite sclerotic and they, and and that they didn't feel like a huge amount of of hope. And that sent I think a lot of people off in quite kind of radical directions. So you did get quite a lot of um, you know we have to smash everything and start again. But I think one thing that's been really interesting is um, you know whether that has been injections of new thinking from new voices that are coming from the tech sector whether it's been things that have happened in new countries, there have been kind of more renewal. And um, so I guess as someone who is sort of pitching institutional renewal, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic than, 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 than I was before. But I guess the kind of, um, the fact that so many, you know, that in a sense, one of the kind of silver linings of the awful situation in Ukraine at the moment is that, you know, many of our sort of, um, the defense mechanisms of, 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 of the West, whether that's sort of sanctions or kind of our, some of the political responses have proved a lot more robust than I think anyone expected, you know, thinking back to the distant days of February, 2022, expected that they would be. So, you know, that's, um, that's something I've updated on, but updated in a way that kind of makes that I feel somewhat positive about. I think I agree. I'd also look at the experience of the US over the last 10 or even 20 years, and essentially their institutions have survived quite a lot of pol political upheaval. And I was speaking to Alex Stapp the other day on a podcast, and he makes the point, or he has this idea that you can have new branches or new pieces in old institutions, and that form of renewal might be an underrated mechanism. So it's still the old body, but actually you've got a new branch. And I see this in companies all the time. You open a new subsidiary or you have a new team. And actually, you, you, I think you might be seeing this in, in, in institutions. You have new little bodies or seeds within them. So you're within a very old institution, but they're starting to do uh, new things. So I think I, might, I think I might agree on that one. Okay, so if you're willing, a short section on overrated, underrated. So this is Tyler Cowan's okay. game on this, and then we'll have a, a couple of final questions. So again, you could go overrated, underrated, you can pass or neutral, or you can put some, uh, some little commentary. Uh, let's go innovation prizes. I think overrated. I think they're, um, I think sometimes they to some extent coast on the reputation of the Anzari X Prize, the kind of cheap space exploration prize, which was very significant because it crowded people into a hitherto underexplored sector. I think the danger of innovation prizes, if they're not doing that, if, if there isn't really a kind of amazing um, a surprise element telling people about a new sector, then they can just be a kind of somewhat somewhat ineffective way of funding because they're so uncertain and people are less likely to be to be interested. Very interesting that the DARPA self-driving cars prizes, which are also described as a kind of great example of challenge-led funding, wasn't a prize at all, or not significantly a prize. It was actually a bunch of very staged bits of funding that was just branded as a prize 
um, more broadly. So on the whole, yeah, classic inducement prizes, I think, are overrated. I, I would prefer better patents personally myself but yeah. because we can't get them maybe i would have to settle for innovation prizes um blogging i think i suppose to the extent that blogging has blogging now feels a little bit like the the, the poor cousin of substack everyone sort of has a substack now and is saying that that's better than that's better than blogging blogging may be a little bit underrated on the grounds that you know there i love a good substack i subscribe to a lot of them but there's something nice about the the, the slightly more permanent structure of a blog and um you don't have that sort of angst where you write a substack send it out and realize there's a typo in it with a blog you can always go back and correct sure and haven't you uh been signed up to be a blogger this year through uh this oh i forget that it's kind of ftx uh, related well, FTX uh, sort of sub 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 stack. Yeah, that's going to happen once I'm back from um, once I've got a few think once the book is launched. Um, yeah, expect more. So you area. must I'm think it's at least it. a little bit underrated to be uh, <laughs> to be drawn into that's that. That's true. That's true. Um, okay, uh, three quick sets of taxes: carbon tax. Underrated, I think. Yeah, it feels like a. Taxing and pricing carbon generally feels like a really effective way of accurately sending signals about um, about the best way of, um, of, of 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 reducing carbon emissions. And you know, given what we were saying earlier about how complex it is and the complexity of systems around climate change, this sort of this this is a, a climate change solution that somewhat decomplexifies things. So I used to think carbon tax was underrated, and now I'm facing having tried to actually really work in this areas of policy and companies and things i worried about the political economy it just seems intractable and so i might be now side swerving and going essentially through more innovation standards actually really uh uh to solve that because i can't see the public currently swallowing it but maybe there might be cultural change so I, i'm kind of open i'm, I'm flip-flopping well uh, i kind of know this one for you but if uh, carbon tax though you think is underrated where do you stand on a sugar tax? Sugar tax, oh, overrated. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical about those things. Not least because I used to be a fan of the San Pellegrino fruit drinks, which have been rendered almost undrinkable by the fact that the sugar tax has had them topped up with, um, with aspartame, which I, I, I just aesthetically object to. Yeah, well, there's an interesting, uh, the biology of it is also a little bit uncertain. There seems to be quite a strong strand of evidence that uh, if you have a baseline level of, call it sugar craving, craving is the wrong word, it's kind of a homeostatic level of wherever you put it. If you use a substitute, it just drives it higher. So if you eat, a, if, you, if you like, or you have a lot of um, sugar substitute products, or even sort of diet coke, if you haven't, depending on where your baseline set is, you just then uh, have more fat coke later on. Uh, it's not entirely clear that it that it works biologically, although it, it's a bit debated. Um, and then maybe one in the middle, plastic bag tax. Yeah, I feel that's a bit. I feel feel a bit. I feel that's a bit overrated. Um, I've certainly been swayed by Robert Whitman's writing on landfill, basically thinking landfill isn't particularly a big problem. I think plastic waste is a problem globally, but not particularly a big problem in kind of Western countries with good landfill systems. Um, you know, it's not the end. I think a plastic bag tax is not the end of the world, but you know, to the extent that it, the carbon effects are not necessarily clear because canvas bags, unless you use them an awful lot, are more carbon intensive than plastic bags. I don't think these things are killing turtles. At least the ones that get thrown away in the UK are probably not killing turtles. Um, and the other thing I worry about this is something that re I really saw when I worked in government, um, is that. Plastic waste really felt like it was distracting political spending, political capital would otherwise been spent on carbon in, emissions. And I think carbon emissions are a real problem. I think plastic waste isn't. And the thing I observed in government is there was a limited amount of political will to do something about the environment. And I genuinely saw time and time again, money, political capital resources that might otherwise have been spent on carbon reduction, basically being spent on plastics innovation funds or plastic bag reductions which is that there is a clear loss to. So I heard from two different sources, although I don't know if this is true, that actually uh, there were industry interests which created the stories around plastic straws 
to deflect from this that they thought let's fo focus literally on the straw man let's focus people on the wow. straws and actually that will deflect from these bigger issues of say carbon tax and things because exactly of your point and to the plastic bags yes you have to use a paper bag five to ten times more on carbon and a uh, cotton bag somewhere between a hundred to a thousand times more and actually organic cotton is actually even worse with that this is a thousand to maybe even ten thousand times more if you're just looking at energy and for the waste part you're right is more problems in rivers and in essentially poor countries with not the waste systems that we have but interesting on the signal okay and then uh innovation agencies underrated on the whole i mean i think this is something that's really important it's really hard to get right but um i think as we said you know we're going to need more state capacity in terms of making these investments and innovation agencies are a really important way of doing this you know we see in places like israel where their innovation agencies work really well that they have made a big difference to the economy so i think it's an area where you know we're, we, we probably underrate their importance yeah, I think I'm neutral to underrated as well. I, I, so I think they're important, but I really think what you need is good people in them. I don't even think you necessarily need that many. So without the agencies, you can't get the good people. But like your point of uh, uh, DARPA and the like is they're filled actually with really good program managers. Um, and that I think is actually more the bottleneck than, than that, but we'll see. Yeah. And then uh, last two, uh, GDP as a measure. Underrated, I think. Um, I was uh, talking to Gus O'Donnell this morning, who was talking about how dreadful GDP is and what a terrible measure it is and how we should all measure about how happy we are. I, I, yeah, I think it is very important to measure how happy we are, but I think it's interesting. If you look at things like Human Development Index, it correlates pretty well to GDP. I think most people who try and sort of sell me on GDP replacements are normally have something pretty suspect or sinister to sell you. I mean, the extreme example being kind of Bhutan, which obviously very famously got rid of GDP, but not in a not in a way I think anyone would politically be happy with. Um, you know, GDP is GDP is 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 not bad, and I think um, it's at least a you know if we can you can tweak it rather than saying well you know let's get people to fill out a like it score about how happy they are and base policy success on that. Sure. Uh, Diane Coyle is very skeptical on uh, happiness uh, index and research, just didn't like it at all, really. And also uh, was quite skeptical on human development index, even though actually she's interested in a lot of um, other things as well. So that's <laughs> that's quite interesting. Um, and then last one on this, uh, UBI, universal basic income. So I think this is probably the, the this is probably my don't know. It sounds like a Sounds like a sort of very good idea to me in principle. I think it's probably very difficult to assess because probably the true impacts of UBI only come when it's kind of guaranteed and therefore it's quite hard to pilot. Um, you know, to the extent I've seen things like the you know Alaskan uh, permanent income permanent income fund, it seems to potentially have some good effects. But equally, I wouldn't say I'm a kind of evangelist for it. So I I I I think I I think I. I probably better keep my mouth shut on on that. I just don't know enough. So in the US, I've heard there's a kind of between the lines, almost Straussian reading of how they uh, do their benefit for essentially a kind of disability. And one reading is that that essential benefit is kind of a pseudo UBI because you tend to get it from your local community. Doctor will say that you are entitled to it. And then when you have it, it's quite difficult to lose it. So it becomes a sort mm. of UBI, but it's not obvious that that's what it's going to be. And you need to know a reasonable amount to get it. So you don't, it's not an automatic thing that, you know, would attract say an immigrant or something going, oh, look, this is the one that I'm going to get. But if you know enough about that and you have a, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of assessment in it because typically a doctor will have to sign off something. And essentially what happens is that your doctor sort of signs you off and goes, kind of do you deserve this so there is there will be some medical element to it but there there is some other judgment uh within that so that's a straussian reading of the fact that i've been told that the us us has uh a pseudo uh, ubi um i don't know how i feel about this one I, i'm also a little bit tempted by this idea which is more uh more problematic but i think more interesting about a kind of almost uh 
uh, universal basic job. So this idea that you give people a kind of job uh, guarantee, uh, I guess it would come with that because I actually think there's a lot of um, essentially socially useful jobs that we don't really do, you know, whether that's um, helping the old lady across the road or planting flowers or, or whatever that is. And why I slightly prefer jobs maybe to UBI. Okay, so you've got UBI, you've got cash, you can kind of do what you want, that frees you. And I kind of quite like that. But jobs, there's a lot of intangible, which comes along with that, like the ability to prove to a prospective employee that you turned up day in, day out for three months, looking after this lady or planting this flower or getting that sort of, that sort of, thing is actually quite valuable for future employees they can say oh like they, they've done that and that's a plus and then this I guess it comes from just speaking to I guess these are the people who had these like manufacturing jobs or, or whatever there's a certain mental health self-worth element to working at something and be given some responsibility that I think we might undervalue so completely politically untractable but I almost wonder whether you need to sort of say, well, if you're going to go to UBI, maybe you should give people a sort of job guarantee and have these kind of jobs, which might be socially useful mm. if, if people want them. Uh, but yeah, completely untractable. Mm. Okay, so final two questions. Uh, what uh, advice would you have to someone who wants to be maybe working in policy or uh, economics or thinking about that? And then the, the sub question is, do you have any uh, advice or life advice in general that you'd like to share? So working in policy, it's a really interesting question. I think at the moment, um, it's an area that is probably, certainly in the UK, I think in the US as well, undersupplied with skills. So it's probably an area where there's a lot of generalists where specific skills, and those might be technical skills, those might be um, those might be analytic skills or coding skills, um, are 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 generally undersupplied. I mean, I came to policy through kind of consulting, so I just set skills from that. But um, I think in general, finding ways of 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 gaining skills like that is 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 is, is, is really valuable. Um, I think you know it's. it's the one, one sort of interesting aspect to that is even in sort of economics, I think there's a lot of people who get economics degrees and master's degrees and PhDs, and that's very valuable for them. I think accountancy is quite underrated, underrated in those kind of areas because actually so much of both policy and political economic things can you can get a real jump on them by um, by the quantitatively less sophisticated discipline of accounting. We probably need more accountants in, in, in economics and in, in policy more generally. And it's quite a, 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 not an economically bad qualification to get either. It's certainly a lot uh, more lucrative to, to, to obtain than an economics PhD. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm long at accountancy. Um, in terms of life advice, goodness me, that is a, that, 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 that is a hard question. I guess my general, my general life advice is that we all, you know, we all probably worry more than we should about things. And um, as I think, was it the US President Calvin Coolidge once said, um, if you see 10 worries running down the road at you, nine of them are very likely to fall into the ditch before they get to you. That's my, um, my, 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 my general philosophy that I try and force myself to remember. Great. So with that, please do check out the book, Restarting the Future. And thank you. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure speaking to you about it. If you appreciate the show, please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast.